that without God's intervention in your life, even as a Christian, without God's grace, without the presence of the Holy Spirit, there's just, there's a, there's a huge limitation. And that is that without God, we can't do good. It, it, we just don't have it. It's impossible. Even as Christians, we are not morally superior or better than those that we would call non-Christians. We are still full of sin and likely to continue in the same. It is only when we become submitted to the Holy Spirit and in His Word find the directions for our lives that we begin to have the opportunity to behave differently. Here is Paul's characterization of his war with sin as a Christian in Romans chapter 7. Here the Apostle Paul, starting in verse 14, says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Paul, the most effective missionary that we know about who in his life dedicated himself, as he describes himself later in this passage, in a way that was more effective and more fruitful than everyone else, lived in this kind of conflict, recognizing that he was overcome with sin and just couldn't do it on his own terms and without help. If this is indeed Paul's self-description, then I think his self-knowledge of his own sin ought to be a challenge to us if we are satisfied. If we think, oh, I'm okay, I'm pretty good, I've got it. I think that reveals a lack of self-knowledge and a lack of God's expectations of this. So this is the bad news, and it's bad indeed. We are born sinners and will remain thus without God's intervention. And even after that intervention has come and begun in salvation, it continues through sanctification in a kind of war for the rest of our lives. And we are inclined to forget that there's a war, which means that we are losing it. But God does, God does not leave this war to us. He promised to win it in Genesis 3.15. He came and lived and died to keep this promise. And so if the big, according to Scripture's beginning is we are sinners, the second part of that and the glorious part of that is that Jesus died. So why is this doctrine important? Why is it important that we have an understanding that Jesus really did die? Well, it has been known from the beginning that sin produces death. God told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that when they sinned, if they did what he told them to not do, then on that day they would surely die. And when they did disobey him, they did experience in themselves a spiritual death and produce for themselves and all of their descendants physical death because of sin bequeathing them to them also um, their sin nature. 
after their sin, death following sin became the norm. Even from God clothing Adam and Eve in skins, there was death because he had to kill animals to procure the skins. Cain's sacrifice, just a few chapter, just a chapter or so later, was rejected around this issue because he did not present the blood of a lamb. God provided a substitute to Abraham for Isaac when God demanded that, uh, that Abraham kill his firstborn son on Mount Moriah. And God provided a substitutionary sacrifice. The law of Moses is filled with death and blood because death follows sin. Hebrews 9.22b says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate death, the death that is to fulfill all the others, the substitute sacrifice is Jesus Christ. And he came as both sacrifice and priest and offered himself before the Father for our sin. He fulfilled all of this death for us and substituted our death with his. In Hebrews chapter 9, we see an extended description of this. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 through 28. There the author of Hebrews says, Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. And these rites are speaking of blood sacrifices and sprinkling with blood. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world, but as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself." Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus died. He died in our place. He functioned as both sacrifice and priest, offering himself not just on an earthly plane, but offered himself in the holiest place in heaven. The, the, the blueprint, the paradigm, the, the, the glorious building which all the earthly tabernacles and temples were supposed to reflect. And through those detailed instructions were to, were to imitate. So Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. It was promised in Genesis 3.15. It was developed and imaged all throughout all that death in the Old Testament. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. Back in Romans chapter 5, um, starting in verse 12, we see this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so that death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come. So we see there that death entered the world. Now, what's interesting is that Paul has got a statement there in verse 12. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and um, death spread to all men for all sin. And then he's got this rather extended explanation of what that means. He resumes sort of his original sentence that, that death spread to all men, um, all, and all sinned later in the passage. We're going to start in verse uh, 18. 
Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so he's restating, summarizing the problem, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. Adam brought sin and death to all of his descendants. Jesus Christ, through his perfect life, through his death, and through his resurrection, gives us the solution to that problem, the opposite to, say, to, to um, Adam's failure. His success makes it possible for us to receive the credit of his righteousness. So by one act of righteousness, that leads to justification in life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we are sinners, and Jesus died because we are sinners. And this is all in accordance with the Scripture. How in accordance with the Scripture is Jesus' death? Is it something that's clearly prophesied? The original promise in Genesis 3.15 doesn't actually sound like death, right? I'm going to send someone, and, he, and he's going to be one of your descendants, and he will crush Satan's head, and in the crushing, his heel will be bruised. Does that sound like a deadly wound? No, it doesn't. And yet there are passages which take the, the, the picture of that one who will destroy Satan's work and develop it further. And we're not going to go into those passages, but I want to list a, just a few just to, to make clear that the Bible reveals Jesus' death. That Jesus' death, as Paul says it here, is according to the Scriptures. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Daniel 9, 26, Zechariah 13, 7. And I could give a longer list, but those are examples of passages which very clearly show that Jesus died in accordance with the scriptures. Verse 4 says that he was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So Jesus was buried. Why is this doctrine important? Paul's got it right there in the list. These things are of first importance. And one of the things of first importance is that Jesus was buried. Well, it was prophesied. Isaiah 53, 9 says that Jesus um, was, that the suffering servant was to be buried with the rich in his death. It's a, it's a direct prophecy in God's word. And so this is in accordance with the scriptures. This death and burial of Jesus Christ, of course, is recorded in all four of the Gospels. And from Paul's perspective, this is in accordance with the scriptures. His place of burial was secured against normal intrusion. Intrusion. What is intrusion? Is that even a word? Hoofta. All right, that's a word. He was, there was a conspiracy theory about a conspiracy theory. You get this? So after Jesus is buried, the religious leaders go to the Roman officials. They go to Pilate and say, Pilate, these guys, we know what they're going to do. They're conspiracy theorists. And they're going to, they're going to make it look like Jesus came back from the dead to, to support their theory and, and to make him look them like the Messiah. And so we need to secure the tomb as strong as we can so that we can make sure to show that these guys aren't going to do this. So it was a conspiracy theory about a conspiracy theory. And, and they're just all worried about this. And so they secured the tomb as best they could. They put, they put an official seal on it. They had it guarded. The place of his burial was secured. In other words, he was there. Would they be guarding an empty tomb? It just doesn't make sense. He was there. His body was inside that chamber, in the earth, in the stone. The conclusion is that his death was genuine. He really was dead. That is, to be resurrected, to really come from death to life, well, you've got to be dead first. Jesus Christ was buried. 
He was buried in accordance with the scriptures. Verse 4 also says that he was raised in accordance with the scriptures. And why is this doctrine important? I'm actually going to spend less time here than anywhere else because Paul answers that question through the bulk of the rest of the chapter. That's what he does. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because we're going to be looking at that in greater detail over the next uh, weeks. But why is, just, just to briefly touch on it, this is one of the main things that Paul will do in this chapter, but in short, Christianity is empty without Christ's resurrection. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we all go to hell. If Jesus is raised, then we will be too. And this gives us hope. It also motivates us to radical Christian living and faithfulness. All of this and much more. Jesus Christ was raised in accordance with the scriptures. And then in verses 5 through 7, the Apostle Paul gives a bunch of evidence that prove that he really was raised. He says, Jesus Christ was raised and these people saw him. Well, why is this doctrine important? I think the first thing we need to notice is that at the time of Paul writing this letter, an investigator could have checked on his sources. Paul is presenting witnesses to a real event as if he were arguing for the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a formal setting. He pe hoped that people would check on his citation because it would only add to their conviction. You see, when Paul lists all these people in these verses, that, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, and at last he appeared to James and then all the apostles and to me. He is saying, you can check with these people. Go ahead. Ask them. Because they will tell you that they saw Jesus in a physical body after he died. And how did that happen? Well, it's in accordance with the scriptures. Sadly, a space of time between these evidences and today has given many the thought that they may discount it. Consider the, consider the list of appearances that Paul gives us here in these verses. This is not like some religions where one person claims to have had a vision of God telling him what to do and then going off and doing something because God told him to or because an angel told him to. So many of this world's religions are based on a single person having an event or a series of events which they claim are God's message to him and all the people that are around him. And that is not what happens here in this instance. It is a long list of multiple people seeing the risen Christ on multiple occasions and in at least one instance with hundreds of people seeing him simultaneously. Consider then also the behavior of this group of people throughout the rest of their lives. If they had conspired together to fake Jesus' resurrection, what could possibly have been their motivation? Well, history tells us that there are plenty of religious charlatans out there. People who will enter into the sphere of religion and preach a particular message that is appealing and then also make a lot of money and get a lot of respect and power while they're at it, right? People like this existed back in Jesus' time. People like this exist today. And these people who use religion as a means to an end for their own glory, for their own prosperity, they can be influenced when their glory and their prosperity is being jeopardized. They are ruled by a policy of self-interest and will back down or change their message when their comfort, when their popularity, when their affluence is threatened. They, they stop if things begin to get difficult. Jesus' followers continued in their proclamation of the gospel against all normal self-interests, even through torture and to the death. They really believed that Jesus was physically back from the dead, hundreds of them. To this day, we have, doctor, we have documentation from one of their contemporaries, a well-respected rabbi among the Jewish people named Saul of Tarsus, newly named Paul the Apostle. And he recorded these events and these people's names in the Bible. 
if the matter that we were, are regarding were any other person than Jesus Christ and his, reaction, his resurrection, all of this would be taken as ironclad evidence for the historicity of these events. But because we live in a system where it's not supernatural against natural, but rather it's God against Satan, God's revelation, God's word gets different treatment than anything else because it is not like anything else. And the person of Jesus Christ, he is not like anyone else. And his resurrection is unique because he is the only one who lived through life sinless so that when he came to death, it wasn't deserved. It wasn't because of sin. It wasn't because of his sin. It was because of your sin and because of mine. And he took upon himself our sin. And we are told that in that, he received the just punishment, the wrath of God that we deserved, and confers on us unimaginable benefits, among them being the credit of his righteousness, the hope of eternal life in heaven, the brotherhood of our, our, our family in the church, and so many other things. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection are the real thing. It did happen, and there's plenty of biblical evidence for that. It is a matter of faith, to be sure, but it is a matter of faith with substance and evidence. It is a sure thing. Not only is it a real thing, a sure thing from the evidence, but it is necessary theologically because God's word promises it and because without it, we have nothing. The evidence for it, physically, is overwhelming. Paul cites himself as a final witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ in extraordinary circumstances in verses 8 through 11. And he gives an accounting of himself as a servant of Jesus Christ in those verses. Let's look at verses 8 and 9 first. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted to the church of God. Paul recognizes that God reached out to him in an extraordinary way. He was late to the service that God had designed for him, and because of his own belief, he was late. Let's review Paul's own account of this in the book of Acts, chapter 26. Um, just an interesting aside. We're going to start in verse 8 because 8 is just interesting. Why is, the th is it th thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? The very issue that we are discussing in our context this morning came up in Paul's personal testimony before Agrippa in this chapter. That's extra. But this, is, this was an issue in Paul's life, obviously, as well. Now, Paul here in verse 9 um, gives an accounting of himself, and he says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And so, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun. And you see how he points out it was at midday? So the sun was up there, and then there was another light up there, and it was brighter than the sun. And he could compare the two for a brief moment before he was blinded. And it shone around me and those who journeyed with me, and we had all fallen to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Jesus had been calling Saul of Tarsus to repentance for some time, and he had been disobeying that call and acting out like so many do when they are convicted. You see, when God calls out to a person and draws them to himself, 
As we know from the parable of the soils, that call isn't always resulting in saving faith, and we discussed that at length last week. In Paul's case, God was calling out to him, and Paul, in his conscience, knew he was being goaded. He knew that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah and that he ought to devote his life to him. But because he didn't want to, he had to destroy all of those who were piling this conviction upon him. And so to squash his own sense of conviction and guilt, he sought to destroy those lives and behavior most emphasized his need for Christ. But then on the road to Damascus, Jesus himself intervened. And so Paul here says, because of his history of persecuting and killing followers of Christ, that he carried with himself a sense of his own unworthiness. He was a man who did more work than anyone else, as we'll see in the following two verses. But he saw all of that work as all the more reason to praise God and to give him credit and glory for it. He was a man of great humility. He laid at the feet of Christ all that he did for his glory, and so ought also we. Verses 10 and 11. He says, so I did in Jerusalem, excuse me, uh, I need to get back to the right book of the Bible. <clears throat> but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether that it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. And so we come to the statement, I believe we all need to appropriate. Let's break it down into two parts. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul knew that notwithstanding his admission in Romans 6 and 7, his struggle with sin, that he was performing excellently to God's glory in his work for the gospel. But he didn't wish to get any credit for this. I know that I worked harder than all of them, but it was not me, it was God's grace in me. I don't get the credit. So the first thing that we need to live out as believers, as Christians, is that by the grace of God, I am what I am. Whatever good I do, whatever excellence I bring to any sphere of my life as um, an employer, as an employee, as a student, as uh, a member of my family, as a member of this church, whatever excellence I bring is because of the grace of God. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Paul's sense of shame as a persecutor and his sense of obligation to his Savior and his dependence upon grace produced a Christian work ethic unequaled by any of his contemporaries. Our Christian work ethic will be directly proportionate to how we view ourselves and what we deserve compared with how we view God and what he deserves. What do you think you deserve? What do I think I deserve? Paul was convinced of at least one thing. He didn't deserve to be saved. He was a persecutor of the church. He was a sinful man. He didn't deserve to have been accepted into Christ's family to be saved from his sin. He was convinced that there was a great distance between himself and God and that God reached across that distance that no man can bridge and specifically called him on the road to Damascus. Because of that conviction, because he saw himself with biblical self-knowledge, knowing that he was a sinner, such as is described by his own struggle in Romans chapter 7. And because he saw that and lived by God's grace, he was able to achieve much. Paul's perspective of the difference between what he deserved and what he got was excellently aligned. What about ours? Or to, to, to put it to the test, what is it when it is taken away from you makes you grumpy, makes you resentful? What is it that you think you have the right to, which if taken away, especially by an act of God, God, God just takes something away from you that you want, that, that's yours, so you think... 
How do we gauge what our rights are? All for as many as received him, to them gave he the right, the power, to be called the sons and daughters of God, to those who believe on his name. That is the only right that Christians ought to hold on to at the cost of losing all else. That doesn't mean that if we live in a nation where rights are being destroyed, that we don't speak up and that we don't oppose the, the wrong and vote for people who will support the right. It doesn't mean that. But the one right that motivates us above every other is that I am a terrible sinner and Christ is an excellent Savior and he deserves everything because he has saved me. The result of all of this in Paul's life and in the lives of others was that the people in Corinth believing were able to establish a church and God was glorified even in this troubled place. If Jesus is raised, then so will I be. Since Jesus was raised, we will be. And since I will be raised, since we will be raised, we should now love and serve him with everything that we've got. For surely, that is what he deserves. Whatever it is that we think we do. Thank you, Father, for what Jesus Christ has done for us. I pray that it would produce in us the beginning of a changed life which tries, which seeks, which hopes to give you what you deserve. I pray that we would have a genuine sense of our sinfulness, but that we would not get turned inward on that into some sort of a spiritual depression, but that having acknowledged that, we would glory in the righteousness of Christ which has been given us and which we may pursue and grow in in this life and which upon the rapture or upon death we will have. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand with me as we sing the final verse of May the Lord Find Us Faithful.